afternoon, everyone. If I can have your attention, my name is Tim Possible. I'm the mayor of the city of Baltimore, and I'd like to welcome you all to Seminar, Episode Two, Part Two. Thank you for coming up to the panel discussion. I'd like to recognize Ms. Marissa Green for doing such a wonderful job today, and Richard back there on the camera. And we actually have an earlier panelist, Marianne from Rocket Fist. Put your hand up there, Marianne, so everybody can see you. But uh, welcome to our panelists and our uh, a mediator. And again, my name is Tim Possible. Everybody have a real good day today and enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Type 
type sequence. Walking Dead in particular, they have what's called Walker School. And that occurs a couple weeks prior to the beginning of every season's production. And that's where you learn how to walk and, and, and maneuver like walkers on The Walking Dead. Now, being that I started in the middle of the season, I was not privy to Walker School. So I got the quick three minute abridged version on set. The, the second Brittany Otero mentioned George Romero, I kind of knew exactly what he was looking for. So it's kind of varied from production to production, and I'll let John elaborate a bit more on, on that, and that you do a bit more of the, uh, the hands-on kind of intense type of work. Yeah. Step one is to be really, really handsome. <laughs> That's not a qualification for Walker, by the way. <laughs> and again, uh, thank you to Mayor Kim and Marissa Green for having us. It's been 15 years since I've been on her now. It's been a phenomenal experience for us. Thank you. Um, my backstory, if you talk to 100 different actors, you're going to get 100 different stories. There's no one way into this. And most people stumble into it, which he did up here. So <laughs> and, uh, my story was uh, back in, I'm a, I'm a big fan myself, G.I. Joe specifically, and Star Wars, Back to the Future, and all that fun stuff. But uh, I'm from Los Angeles, living in New Orleans. One day a buddy of mine came up and said, hey, they're going to start filming a new G.I. Joe movie here. I'm going to go meet with the casting director to see if I can get on. Would you like to come? And I said, well, I'll go to keep the company. They're not going to hire us. We can go have lunch and hang out. <clears throat> so he went, he met with his casting director. I sat on the couch and waited. When she came out, she said, hey, are you with my company? And I said, no. She said, because you have a great look, I can get you a ton of work as a cop or a soldier. Okay, whatever, didn't think much of it. So that day I got up on five things, just like that. Now in my normal day-to-day -day life, I'll be in the Home Depot flea market, and people always thank me for my service. I've never been in the military, I'm not a cop. For whatever reason, I look, I, I fit that, uh, that role. So, uh, the hair. Uh, I've asked military friends, why does that happen? So when you got the haircut, you walk like you know what you're doing. I really don't. And uh, you have great posture. So you mentioned you were fit. Okay. Well, maybe when you met me, you thought the same thing. This guy's in the military. Well, I read your bio, so I did. That's a lot of fun. the Fantastic Four, I went to go get my props, and the prop guy was looking at me, and he walked up, he said, you're an officer, right? I said, I'm not a little police officer, which was the role I was playing. He said, no, you were in the military, you're an officer, right? I could tell by your every answer. Anyway, they booked me on five things that day. And I'm self-employed, so I have incredible flexibility. So uh, my buddy, whose idea the whole thing was, said that he didn't get hired. To this day, he's only ever done three things. And I turned down on three things a week. So I'm very, very blessed and fortunate in this privilege. So thank you for your service. <laughs> so uh, I go with it. It keeps me busy and it gives me a lot of freedom in that I'm not going to do anything I don't want to do. I want to do specific roles and that's it. So I started off on uh, 21 Jump Street. You can see me in the background, so I'm not doing background and extra stuff. But pretty quickly, I would get on the set and they would just hand me a gun and assume I knew what I was doing. And of course, I kept my mouth shut and just went with it. <laughs> because there are a lot of veterans that I do run on to watch sets, and there's a lot of downtime. I would just get together and ask them to show me how all this works and the terminology. And on a lot of these movies, you get military training for a few days or a few hours. So I just kind of went with it and built up and built up and built up. And the uh, movie industry, like any, any uh, employment situation, it's a job. You build relationships, you're a good worker, you take direction, you do your job, you don't complain. Unnecessary. And you're just part of the team. So at this point, five years into it, I have a reputation, I have references, and I have a resume. So, you know, I, it, it's a job. I treat it 100% like a job. How many hours do you usually put in on? It depends on the scene. Like, I prefer to do the special ability featured stuff. Um, but if it's a principal role where you have lines and, and, and stuff like that, you get into your scene and you're done. If, if that's all that's required. Because I've been an episode of NCIS and the Orleans, we're on there for two hours and I'm done. But something like Planet of the Apes, uh, I 
think I was originally hired for two weeks, but that built into four weeks total. Um, because it was recurring, I played Gary Oldman's officer. And originally they hired 12 of us that we were going to be with Gary for all his things. And uh, some people dropped out, so I just picked up their names just like any other job. Somebody said I took over. You know, for whatever reason they couldn't do it, for me I just see an opportunity. I'm going to use this, you know, to my advantage, and I'm going to be that go-to guy that covers for people. And it worked out, because later when I did Jurassic Park and Terminator, those were direct results of, hey, someone's so referred to me because they worked with someone on Atlantic News. And we had it. So now I'm not going to get the rest of the world, they're calling me. So that's how I see it. Hey, talk about also the special ability. Uh, as far as marketing itself, is there, is there anything that you do in particular that you can maybe tell anybody that's out there that's aspiring to be an actor or actress, uh, you know, how to kind of hone in on those special abilities or? Um, a lot of people ask me this a lot, and how do I get into this? And uh, my answer, and maybe you'll have a different answer, is I can look at everybody in this room and I can see how a casting director sees people. And uh, as long as you're comfortable with what your niche and how people perceive you, I'm a really nice guy. But people don't usually see me that way. They see me as angry or a jerk, and that's happened my whole life. It doesn't bother me. But I understand that, and I accept it. I don't do it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as long as you're okay with your niche and you accept uh, your role in Hollywood, you can do okay with it. Now, yesterday I got an audition for a fisherman. That's a complete waste of my time because I know I don't look like a fisherman. I'm not going to pass for one. I'm honored to have been asked. I would love to go audition. I'd love to do it. It's just isn't going to happen. So I got a second call back for a CIA director in the movie. I know I can do that. Okay, so I know my role and I'm okay with it. Never been in the CIA, but I know what I look like on camera. And I know what I can do. I don't know, the door is behind the desk and you can tear it down. Um, so I'm okay with it. So as long as you know your role and your place and what people can see you at, you Yeah, I would agree to, to some extent in regards to the niche. I think that will get you into the industry initially, but if you want to make the leap to becoming an actual professional actor or an actress, uh, what's going to make you a good actor or a good actress is modifying that niche, expanding your abilities, and while John might not think he can portray a good fisherman, I'll bet you if you put him on camera, tested his boundaries a little bit, I'll bet you John can pull it off brilliantly. And I think that that is what makes a good actor or a great actor is just having a broader range and a broader ability to not, I don't want to say stereotype or typecast, because the last thing I want to be remembered for is as a zombie actor. Um, you know, we all kind of have uh, bigger aspirations than that. But, um, yeah, I would, I would definitely agree that, that you have to be comfortable initially with what uh, you're getting booked for. Uh, during the Hunger Games, we were under strict contractual obligation not to shave anything from the neck up. We were not allowed to cut our hair, we were not allowed to shave. So I was working on Vampire Diaries one day. It was a uh, Mardi Gras scene. And the assistant director walks up to me and he's like, would you be terribly offended if we made you a homeless person? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> he uh, wheels me a shopping cart and he walks away. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm not offended by the fact that you want to make me a homeless person. I'm offended by the fact that you've done absolutely nothing to make me look like a homeless person. <laughs> to tell me. So, you know, it, it, it can limit your abilities sometimes. And for the Hunger Games, for that, you know, good month and a half, two month run, where I was contractually obligated, I had to be comfortable with that niche. I had to be okay with the fact that, you know, early, you know, mountain men, biker, homeless guy, you know, drug addict, those were the roles that, that I was kind of stuck with for that period of time. Um, so, yeah. There was a movie that came out a couple months ago called uh, Our Language is Crisis with uh, Sandra Bullock. And uh, they called me in to audition for that. And uh, the initial role was for a moderator. I was uh, an American uh, giving some classes to some uh, Bolivian um, 
peasants. So I went in, one of my car went in an audition for the casting director. And I went home, she said, we'll be back in just two weeks. Uh, two weeks later, she emailed me and she said, uh, well, the director liked it, but he wants to swap to uh, uh, protest her leader, you know, and protest, I think this, this guy in charge of protest, I've seen. And uh, so I went in for two paragraphs of parts, uh, part two paragraphs, went in to have my audition, then with the director. Before I said a word, he said, I want to meet with you in person to see how you carry yourself. The part that you read that I had to read for was, protest leader who's supposed to be this humble guy and we just do not come off that way. He says, I want to make you the U.S. ambassador to Bolivia. So now I've done all this work, you know, learned my lines, and he's walking on the spot, so I had to go with it. Eventually I did get the part, and that was a person there. <laughs> I had a conversation with Norman Aritas one day on the set of The Walking Dead, and he told me that acting is very much like a muscle that you have to constantly work out, you have to constantly exercise, and that's all part of testing your balance, just testing what you think you're capable of, what you are capable of, because what you think you might be capable of, others may think you're, you're more, you know, and, and, and the example, the, uh, the assistant district attorney is a, is a perfect example. Um, you never want to limit yourself. You know, a, a good actor can do anything. The actor can go on camera and portray whatever is asked of them. And it's a muscle. And it takes you're always exercising that muscle and becoming that much stronger of an actor. I think it's not easy and it shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be. It should be something that's a challenge. And that's why you do things like John said, research. You know, it's a part that you're not quite familiar with. Um, I have an independent project coming up soon. Uh, that deals with a, uh, a veteran dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm not a veteran either, uh, but best believe I'm going to be Googling, I'm going to be researching exactly what these types of people go through, I'm going to be talking to people that have gone through it, and I'm going to do the research and I'm going to be as educated as I possibly can come time to shoot that role. So it's not just a matter of getting up there and the director yelling action and in front of a camera, you know, it is very much a job and not always an easy one. Um, on the long kind of the same lines is, is you know, getting advice, giving advice, what is some of the best advice that you've received on any assessment, whether it's a seasoned actor or not, um, that's kind of helped you guys along with your career? Um, I have an acting coach, and uh, the one thing he told me is the one time you're guaranteed to act is in the audition room. He says, if you get called in for audition, if you're going to act, you need to do that part. You may never be hired. That's the one time you are guaranteed that you're going to act. So be ready. That's the one that stuck with me. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree with that. Um, I would also say that the um, majority of the major actors and actresses I've had the chance to kind of pick their brain. Um, I was told to do as many independent projects as you possibly can. You know, a lot of these are going to be passion projects, which, you know, equal zero pay, but, but you're honing your craft. You're working that muscle. You're, you're, you're testing your own boundaries. You're becoming a better actor. So independent film is, uh, of course, obviously much more relaxed, and it's not, you know, make or it's not going to make or break you. But you can test different things and in theater and, and, and kind of nurture your ability, your acting ability, uh, to a way that best suits you. And even student films, I'm not I live in New Orleans, just showing the uh, film uh, program. But, I mean, I've, I've tried to get off student films, and I get the night on those sometimes. But I mean, I'm happy to do them because it's, it's experience. Uh, and what are some of the, what the actors we can start with? Uh, we can start with Michael. What was your favorite either TV show or movie, you know, role that you played, uh, and why? And also, did you, did you have, did you guys have to keep any like weird, memorable <laughs> No comment. <laughs> um, every role I've ever had the opportunity, or every production I've had the opportunity to portray, uh, it, it's been special and unique in its own way. 
My most fun day ever on any set would definitely be Anchorman 2. To be on set with Will Ferrell as Ron Burgundy almost happened in slow motion for me. I mean, it was almost a blur. I mean, it really, I mean, Baxter the dog was on set that day. I mean, it was like, just, just is this really, really happened? You know, I remember watching Anchorman laughing my butt off and been a huge Will Ferrell fan forever. But to be standing next to this man, you know, that there's so many opportunities we get in this industry that we never thought in a million years we would be experiencing, yet alone sitting up here in front of folks and, and sharing these experiences. Um, they would do one take by the script, and then they would do 15 takes at yep. And it's just amazing to see the methods and the processes that these different actors and actresses go through. Um, but I, I actually forgot the question. It was, it was a my favorite project, yeah, project. and Mementos. Uh, I, uh, the scene I worked on on Anchorman 2, we were at um, a chicken shack, and uh, Champ Kind, a uh, sportscaster, uh, part of Ron's news team, uh, owns a chain of chicken restaurants. And I kept the napkin that had the chicken shack logo on it, which I actually went to see um, David Koshner stand up a few months later and I brought that napkin to him and I had him sign it and he wrote whammy on it. It was like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, Walking Dead, uh, you get a lot of unique things. I have quite a few shell casings that you kind of just yoink, put in the pocket, you know. Um, okay. I, this is the most obscure piece of memorabilia, and it came from The Walking Dead, um, and I'm going to try to keep this PG, because uh, there's children in here. Um, Greg Natero uh, likes to put all sorts of really gross things inside dead bodies, uh, one of which uh, are blood-filled prophylactics. <laughs> <laughs> uses those because when they pop, they like splat. I don't know what it is, so when they pop, they kind of explode and it creates this really neat splat. Well, I happened to obtain a fully intact blood fill <laughs> filled with walker blood from the walking dead. My wife thought I had lost my mind. <laughs> what are you going to do with that? And I wasn't about to Google how to store a blood filled condom. <laughs> that were sure to follow. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you, you, you get little mementos. I'm very curious to hear of any mementos you've uh, obtained. And don't say none. <laughs> I've been very tempted. Don't some... give it up, man. I've been very tempted for something to just mysteriously disappear. But I have acted on it. Now, uh, now I look like a jerk. <laughs> Uh, there are opportunities, for example, like I worked the last day of filming on the first Pitch Perfect movie, and uh, a lot of the stuff they buy for these movies, they use them in their demo. So on the last day of filming, I, I played a cop, and uh, I was hanging out with a wardrobe person, she said, by the way, today's the last day of filming, anything you want from wardrobe for sale, it's cheap. So I bought a 300 dollars suit for like 10 bucks. But they just have to unload this stuff and move on to the next production. So, uh, fire station. Yeah, we had one on the set. Yeah. So, uh, for the movie uh, The Butler, I worked on with, I did a single drop in Williams. Um, I was cut. It was a great experience. But I went to the fire food sale for that. I bought a whole bunch of souvenirs. That was cool. And, uh, I think what else? I have one more. When I did uh, Dumb and Dumber 2, we shot a uh, computer convention scene that took about two weeks to film it. And I kept my uh, my lanyard, my fake name. <laughs> yeah, there's got to be something. You... Are there any police officers? <laughs> <laughs> Are they all outside. They just had a fire sale like two weeks ago for American Horror Story. For 
seasons three and four, and I forgot to you know, double the cool plants and stuff off that. A lot of this stuff just gets unloaded dirt cheap. Because I mean, I filled up the backseat of my car with historical stuff when we bought it. I think it was $60. And, uh, yeah, good stuff. Um, like I said, the suits, I mean, they buy us for, for Broken City, like Russell Crowe's bodyguard. They brought me in for a wardrobe fit, and then when I went to go wear my outfit, the suit came out. It was like a $1,500 suit that I wore three days. And I know that they just uploaded it for like 20 bucks. And uh, what was the part of that question? What was your favorite project? Oh, my favorite project. Uh, as he mentioned, every project has its own highs. So I mean, I could really never pick one that was my favorite. Um, Donna Planet is probably, I mean, that opened so many doors. You know, that, that so many wonderful things came out of it. But what's unfortunate, as I'm sure you confess to, is you go on these highs, the production ends, and you're unemployed again. You don't know what the next thing is. It's probably not going to be a high. It's going to be a major downer for maybe two or three months, and the next high comes up. But there's a few highs, but uh, it's a beast or famine industry. Yeah, it's not good. If you like consistency, stay away from this. <laughs> I've got a couple more questions in the real, but some questions for the audience. Um, folks on time. Do you have any helpful tips for aspiring actors? Um, basically, how to ass assemble a resume. Um,
the training process on how to do all of the things behind the camera, the hundreds of names you see at the end of the credits in a movie. You know, these are the whole, these are the jobs that Georgia is struggling to fill. So, first thing you do is get on a set, and the best way to do that is as a, a background artist or an extra, and whatever you want to call it, and network. Again, don't be the wallflower in the corner on your cell phone all day. Introduce yourself to other actors. Eventually, you're going to come across one or two that do independent films on the side. Great, now you have a contact that's an independent film director. Now you can start doing some indie projects. You can start building a reel based off of that. Um, there are so many routes that you can take once you get onto a set, whether it be in front of the camera or behind the camera. But once you get on that set, you start becoming overwhelmed with all of the opportunities that are abound behind the camera. Every little job, whether it be crafty or it be catering or it be lighting, electricians, gripping, rigging, camera operators, it's a whole team of people that assemble these films and these productions. And there's so many different paths that your passion can lead you. So if it's not necessarily in front of the camera, there's a whole world of opportunity behind the camera. And more consistent. What's that? More consistent. Exactly, exactly. It's definitely more consistent. You know, uh, actors, you might get hired for a role that they, uh, you know, maybe a day player role. And day player roles are just that. You're usually only there for a day or two. Um, there's a lot of hustling involved in being an actor, which is why a lot of people who make the step and make the decision to, I want to do this professionally, I want to be an actor, hire agents, because then they can hustle for you. And all you do is show up to the, you know, the auditions and, you know, you do your thing, but um, it, it's definitely a lot more stable. And I'm actually doing a lot more work behind the camera now because of the fact that it's so stable and I've been doing some independent projects here and there. There might be a project, uh, and again, it's, like John said earlier, it's a very good place to be in when you want to be selective, where you don't have to work. You know, oh gosh, I'm working on the next Tyler Perry movie. I have zero interest in the day. <laughs> Why am I working on this movie? You can be selective. Oh, you know what the new G.I. Joe movies, I'm a huge fan. I want them. You can pursue the, the, the roles that you want and the projects that you want rather than having to fill your Monday to Friday with being Mary Jane. And it's a show that I've never seen one episode of, but you know, I worked on it for a day because it filled a day worth of work, you know. So um, just follow your passion wherever it takes you, which is it's the best advice I can get you back guys. Really, getting on a set, experiencing it for at least one day, maybe a complete and total turn off. Or if you just open your eyes and say, man, I really want to do this. There's a lot of people that started at the same time as I did. Five years later now, you know, one of them works in catering. One guy went on to do uh, hardcore stunts. One guy's made his own movies. I worked in sound. Everybody kind of branched off. See, some people decided they want to be, you know, normal actors. And, uh, you know, so many different paths you can end up on, but really, uh, get on the set and make that decision. Because I think a lot of people say, I'll take class after class after class after class. It's like, okay, that, that's great, but at some point you've got to make that leap in the real world and maybe just completely, completely raise the experience of your life. Doing classes, you may hate it. That's my opinion. Get time for one more question. No, I have okay. Anybody got a question? This is the fastest hour in the history of hours. Um, let's see. Uh, on G.I. Joe, when I was a Cobra Trooper, and I'm an 80s kid, I'm sure a few of you guys are, and Snake Eyes, a big Snake Eyes tattoo, it's been on my arms since the 90s. And uh, so Ray Park played Snake Eyes, also played Darth Maul in Star Wars. But he, he shot me a few times. And, and I'm not a soldier, I've never been out in battle. But when you're on a set and somebody's shooting a gun at you, filled with blanks. There's squibs going on around you and people are dropping. It's pretty real. That was pretty cool. Death by Snake Eyes. <laughs> also, he was Darth Maul. Yes. One more question. Did you answer? 
Uh, no, um, I, I would. Uh, mine is a tie. Um, the scene on Walking Dead, uh, season three, episode fifteen. There's a scene where Michonne is tied to a post, and Merle is trying to hotwire a car so they can uh, travel to Woodbury. And I end up getting kicked in the chest by Michonne, and then my head stopped. Um, you win. There's nothing. <laughs> There's nothing more surreal than seeing your own head get stomped on television. It's like, oh, there's a memory of the birth of my first child. And, um, that was a very surreal experience. Um, the second you haven't seen yet, and it will take place in Stephen King's cell, and I got to check off a bucket list item. I get killed by Samuel L. Jackson with a shotgun. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily easier to get an agent, it's easier once you get an agent. Uh, because the agent does all the footwork for you. They are the ones who, who you know, uh, you, you predetermine what roles you want to go after, and they seek out the auditions and, and, and book them for you, and you kind of show up and do your thing, I'll let John. And, and to be honest, I mean, you're a product. I'm a product to an agent. You meet with the agent, and first they have to accept you, you know, you do a monologue, and, and, and if you have a demo reel, they see what you can do and how you look on camera. So when they get calls from production, hey, we need a cop, he has his clientele, his clients who play cops or whatever roles, he knows this individually. So he's going to say, well, I'm going to send these three guys for this cop role. Um, so yeah, he does all the legwork, but even getting an agent is kind of difficult. You have to get, it's, it's a really strange situation because you have to get experience to get an agent. And how do you get experience with that agent? Again, the easiest way is not necessarily easy, but if you get on as an extra background, that's the easiest way out to a set. Or maybe people start asking questions. And really, most people are happy to help. I mean, I'm sure some of you have talked to us at our tables. We're happy to share whatever we can with you. Because, uh, again, we're both fans from our childhood and days. And for us to have the opportunity to do this is like a dream come true. I mean, and I'm happy to share it with anybody that wants to do the same thing, because for me, it was awesome. I want everybody to share that. I agree. To, to, to wake up in the morning and, and, and smile because you get to go to work, not because you have to go to work, that's a great place to be. And I, I want as many people to be able to experience that as possible because you can't put a price on that. I work 13 years in retail management, so I don't have to do it.